here. So we're going to start our afternoon programming. We have Bill Bill Halfman here, the beef outreach specialist. I'm uh, going to talk about this uh, beef market we're in, and hopefully this, you know, prices stay good for a long time, and hopefully we'll have plenty of grass to feed everybody this year. So thanks, Bill. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, so I'm, I actually borrowed the first bunch of slides that we're going to go through from uh, Dr. Brenda Botel, who's our livestock marketing economist. So if any of you guys were up at, uh, or, or ladies were up at Lens Group here a couple, three weeks ago, this should look pretty similar, and I hope that I address it as well as Dr. Botel does. Um, so we'll get moving along. I've got some other things at the end that I put together to share with you as well. So uh, we're going to look at some domestic and uh, export demand for our proteins, both beef cattle and, and the other uh, pork and, and uh, poultry. Uh, talk a little bit about input costs. And uh, of course, weather is a big factor on how things move or don't move with uh, build back. Um, and then I'll uh, share with you a few other things on uh, livestock risk protection and considerations for retaining heifers. All right, so if we look at this, this would be commercial production over the last roughly nine years. And uh, as we're moving across there, you can see that uh, it's been relatively consistent with a slow growth. Uh, as we look at 2024 compared to 2023, we're going to see a little bit more chicken. Uh, turkey should be about the same. Those two are going to be somewhat dependent on uh, avian influenza outbreaks and the potential there. Pork should be pretty similar. Uh, we are going to see beef decline again uh, this year due to widespread drought and uh, some slow things going on there we'll talk about in more detail later on. Yeah, the brush fire would be one of those additional things. So if we look at domestic demand in the right hand, far right hand column on the right hand chart is uh, the poultry and it's expected as you can see to increase. That graph is a little misleading. It, it, it's not really half turkey and half poultry, okay? The, the bottom line of that graph starts at 85, uh, I think it's billion pounds, okay? So that's, that's the top end of the poultry with the, with the turkey stacked on top. And, um, and you can see there, you know, that's going to be one of the lower priced proteins that folks are going to be able to buy. The chart on the left, the dotted line across the bottom is, is, is the composite boiler price or the, the and then the red line is, uh, is pork prices in the middle there. The blue line up at the top is, is beef prices. So, you know, as we look at these things and folks got to go to the grocery store and they have X amount of dollars to buy food, they're going to have to make some choices. Um, so we do expect poultry to go up a little bit. Uh, pork demand, we, we expect that to be similar uh, to last year. And, uh, and you can see kind of how that looks. And um, then moving across the beef, we see that going down. We see it going down some. Part of that is supply. Part of that is it's the highest price protein there is. Um, interestingly enough, though, you know, it looks like, well, that's not where we'd like to see it. But beef demand has actually surpassed expectations, both uh, in retail and wholesale in 2023 in spite of persistent economic uncertainty and major slowdown in beef exports. So prices did advance considerably throughout the first six months of the year, and the composite cutout is set to average uh, all-time record at 296 a hunterweight on an annual basis. Retailers did have to respond to that with higher wholesale price, uh, to the whole higher wholesale price by raising retail beef prices to new records with uh, USDA all fresh beef price reaching 794 a pound in the fourth quarter of last year. So some of the things that remain in 2024 that to point towards lower demand next year, the strong labor market that had been supportive to demand, but started to uh, cool down in the latter half of 2023. Get this out of the way here. Interest rates are not expected to return to levels seen before 
the pandemic, which will be another adjustment for consumers and businesses that enjoyed the low rate environment from 2009 to 2022. And uh, there is also, also some beginning actual rumblings about a recession coming into play and money getting tighter and folks making some choices. Uh, one of the workshops I was at recently, they said they're starting to see maybe a little more gravitation towards hamburger instead of steaks and roasts, but it's still beef. Um, household debt has continued to increase and consumer savings have declined. And as that happens, the real disposable income has leveled off and adds another hurdle to help sustain uh, that pace of consumer demand for beef, even though so far they said, hey, we still like to eat beef and want to. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with, uh, with domestic demand for beef. Um, so where are we headed? In general, retail prices are going to stay high. Uh, they expect fresh beef up 4.6% this year. Uh, pork down a little bit because there's a lot of pork out there. And uh, poultry down 2% uh, as well. Again, as I indicated, so there will be a little bit of weaker domestic demand. Consumer confidence, uh, economic uncertainty is starting to have a little bit bigger play on things. And so in general, we expect the prices uh, from a retail standpoint to be stable uh, and maybe a little bit higher yet. So we'll talk some about exports. One of the challenges with exports is we have a strong dollar. And when the dollar is strong, that means that the other country's buying power for U.S. product is, is lower. And so that will have a, a negative uh, impact potentially on, on uh, exports. So if we look at um, what we expect for uh, chicken, you can see over in the upper right column that they expect the poultry exports to remain similar to the past year. Some of the challenges there, though, are the, the avian influenza. And we know that some of the countries actually have already uh, banned exports temporarily from uh, Ohio and uh, California because of some outbreaks there. And so that's going to potentially have some negative influences on poultry exports. And, um, so that's kind of what's going on with the chicken. Turkey, we actually, again, if the avian influenza doesn't come into play, expect to see those actually increase this next year. Uh, some of that was the turkey had more problems with avian influenza in the past year. And so um, they're kind of bouncing back from some of that. But we do know there's been a few instances already where the avian influenza has affected uh, some of the turkey production areas uh, late last year. We have to wait and see how that does or does not influence things moving forward. Uh, pork exports are expected to be pretty close to the same as last year. Uh, some of the challenges with the pork production. Oops, got some news in my cheat notes here from Dr. Botel on some of these. Um, they did rebound in 2023 compared to what they were in 2022, um, but that can be attributed to Mexico uh, and low U.S. prices allowing uh, the U.S. to expand tonnage. The, ten, the five largest uh, destinations for pork are Mexico, Japan, China, Canada, South Korea, and Colombia. And the U.S. actually has 85% share of the Mexican pork import market, and uh, those are actually up some. And the uh, U.S. has 29% of the Japanese market, but those are down a little bit from the past. So uh, moving into the beef, uh, U.S. beef exports will finish 2023 down about 14%, while imports are on track to actually be 7% higher. So what's going on there is a smaller U.S. beef production. We're down in pounds of production. And higher prices and the strong dollar our major contributing factors to these moves and will likely remain in place for the next few years to come. The uh, decline in exports has been led by 17 to 22 percent declines to Japan, South Korea, China, and the uh, largest exports. Uh, those are the largest export markets for U.S. beef. So, um, 
South Korea being the largest, and they're down 18%, Japan down 21, and China down 22%, but Mexico is up 12%. So growth in beef imports was expected. Um, and if we think about that, the meat that we export, that's the middle meats, the high value roasts, uh, loins, steaks, and uh, they, it actually, if we look at the dollar value, it's a higher dollar value than what we import. The beef that we import to the country, and we always say, well, what are we importing beef for? We've got all of it here, right? Well, we eat a lot of hamburger in the United States, and so what we import in the United States is the, the very trim, the, call it grind, uh, from South American places like that to help meet that demand, and we mix in all the excess fat trim off of the, of the fed cattle uh, to produce the burger to meet the the, uh, the U.S. demand. So, but they are expected this next year to de decline another five percent. Um, and with some additional declines following in large part because it's going to take us a while to build production back up and so if you don't have it you can't sell it. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about weather. This would be, uh, and the higher the line is on this chart the worse conditions are. So if we look at the Corn Belt uh, and the blue line being 2023 at the end of 2023 there was somewhere around 35% of the, the pasture and range uh, was poor and very poor condition. And that shouldn't surprise anybody here because we had a fair amount of the Corn Belt was drought conditions last year and Wisconsin was kind of right in the middle of it. Um, the chart on the right hand side shows the nationwide range and pasture condition. Uh, and even with that 2023, it was close to the same as, as what the Corn Belt was. So, we have some weather situations to uh, hopefully things will improve. That's what, uh, that's what we need to happen. Uh, and then again, moving in further, another weather impact is hay stocks, December 1st hay stocks. And you can see that we were a little bit better off at the end of 2023 than we were in 2022, um, but still quite low, okay? Again, a lot of this driven by, by drought conditions. And if we look at a map, to kind of see where we're seeing some of these uh, hay stock declines. Uh, you can see Minnesota and Wisconsin are, in, are right in the middle of it with pretty big decreases for our states compared to a year ago. Um, we also got to be a little bit careful when we look at uh, you know, Iowa. They're down some yet too, but you know the Dakotas and Nebraska and some of those places are up. But Two years ago, they had a very severe drought and were very low, and so their build back is still better than it was, but probably not close to back where they would like to see it. You can see Oklahoma was really, really bad. They've got a fair amount of uh, moisture last year and were able to build back up uh, quite a bit in, in that situation. So we ought to be able to look at these and keep in mind what's been going on uh, to help explain what's going on with our with our hay stocks. Uh, so that's one of the things that's affecting cattle numbers and uh, regrowth. Um, so let's just kind of look at what we expect to see for production for this next year. So if we look at turkeys, uh, the brown bar on the far right would be the, this would be in quarters of the year. As you can see, if, if the avian influenza doesn't have a big impact on it, we expect turkey to, in general, increase uh, up probably 3% uh, from the year before, and, uh, and price was, should get just a little bit better uh, moving, whoop, moving forward with that. Not sure which, there we go. Chicken, um, we can see that that's going to increase over the previous year. Uh, we're expecting in uh, 2024 for that to increase about 2%, and um, and if we look at pork, uh, there has been some, some increase there. Uh, that's been slowed some um, because there was a lot of excess production of pork. Um, they're going to have a tough time growing much more than, than what's shown there because there was some liquidation of the breeding herd uh, due to lack of profitability. Another concern with pork is the, the uh, farmer animal confinement. Proposition 12, where some of the states are making uh, 
pass some legislation about that, in California in particular, with uh, South F and having at least so many square feet. And it will take a while for the pork industry to be able to, to address those kinds of things moving forward. Is that correct, Steve? That is correct. That's Steve, my hog farmer resource here. So, um, so if we look at beef production and where have we been, and you can see that uh, steer slaughter has been down um, 2%, heifer slaughter has been down 4%, beef cow slaughter has been down 13%. That's because we have less herd to slaughter, okay? Um, and you can see on the top left-hand side, that's steer slaughter, and it's up a little bit. Uh, this year, that has a lot to do with when animals were placed in the feedlot. Uh, same with heifers over in the upper right, and of course, cow slaughter would be the lower left there, and so we're seeing um, the lower numbers just because there are less cattle out there. That gives us an idea of uh, commercial slaughter comparing uh, what happened in 2023, and we'll get into what we think is going to happen in 2024 in a couple of more slides. So not only do we have slaughter down, we also had dress weights down because we finally were getting out of that COVID where animals were kind of backed up and being fed to really heavy weights, okay? Uh, so one of the questions is wondering about when are we going to start to see herd rebuild? And one of the, the main thing we look at with that is what percent of the cattle on feed are heifers, okay? And so if we look at uh, this chart out here at the, in, in uh, 2023, we're still up there close to 40% of the cattle being fed out um, is heifers. And if we think about that, we're always gonna have some amount of cull cow turnover, so we're gonna have to have some amount of heifers just to replace the cows that get culled. And if we say, okay, on average, we should see half the calves being bull calves and half the calves being heifer calves, that kind of suggests 10% uh, of them are not in the feed yard, right? Make sense? So when you look back at, uh, at 2014, 2015, you see that percent of heifers in slaughter go way down. And if, if you remember, that was after the 2012 and 2013 droughts and prices were really high and things were really good. And so folks retained heifers and worked on building the herd back and you can kind of see them, we get out in that 19 area and they started slowing down that, that herd rebuild at that point in time. Uh, we got a little bumping around because it seems like somewhere in the country has been having a drought just about every year. Um, and depending on where it has a impact on how many cows get liquidated or heifers not Kept. So, looking forward, we're probably going to see cold cows decline uh, another 200,000 head from the year before just because their cows aren't out there. Uh, calf crop is down about 2% in 2023, and we expect to see it down another 2% this next year. So, that's kind of where we're at with. Uh, that aspect of things, and you can see the uh, change. This is year-to-year -year change in cattle inventory, not overall long-term. So again, we saw another decline in uh, herd inventory in uh, 2023, the, the long dark red line, and we expect it to probably go down a little bit more yet this year, uh, just due to where things are at, forage supplies, and uh, a little bit of uncertainty of what's gonna happen, how well are we gonna bounce back from the, the dry weather that we've had. If we look at change in beef cow numbers from one year to the next, you can see uh, certain parts of the country liquidated a lot of cows last year, uh, big changes. Wisconsin was down uh, 20,000 cows from a year before. Um, Iowa was down quite a bit more again as well. So that's still continuing, uh, largely due to weather situations few spots in the country they're starting to try to build back. This is not, you know, and this kind of tells us another story. How are we doing with heifers that have been reported to be held as replacement heifers? This is beef cows, not, not dairy cows. And 
it's down in 2023. You can see as low as it's been in the last since 1994, and we expect that to drop just a little bit more again in 2024. Um, so, but that means we got high prices now because we have short supply. It's going to take a long time. Cattle cycles probably the slowest one to change. The fastest one we can change is is, is poultry. Um, as we think about when the, that heifer is born, it's going to take two years before that calf will be born her first calf, and then it won't be ready to be sold again for probably six more months as a feeder calf. Okay, so it takes a long time for these things to change in the in the beef cycle. Um, so what do we expect for production? Well, here's uh, here's what we expect for feeder calf supplies. And as you can see there, we expect that, no surprise, 2024 is going to be smaller yet again. And we're going to see some, we have seen some changes in feeder cattle numbers in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's kind of interesting from uh, the feeder cattle standpoint. And um, a lot of our calves will go outside the state. A lot of times what our farmers will do, and you guys probably, some of you are doing this, if you're going to finish some out or background them or whatever, You'll sit there and you'll look at what the price of the calves is, and you're feeding your own corn, and you look at what you can sell your corn for, and you say, how much risk do I want to assume turning that uh, feed into a calf or growing a calf? And if it's big enough, you let somebody else take the risk, okay? So this is uh, feeder calves outside. So this would be um, those that are out on uh, wheat pasture, like in Oklahoma, they actually got decent rain, they've got decent wheat, and so they've got more calves on wheat pasture than they did a year ago. Well, but a year ago they were really bad dry, so there wasn't too many. So, and a lot of those calves are not, historically we would see a fair amount of calves go on wheat pasture or some kind of backgrounding program before in the feed yard, but with short supplies of cattle, uh, a lot of those are actually going straight into the feed yards and not doing so much of the backgrounder type thing. And that's where we see this. Uh, placements were down, and, uh, but more of them were going directly in, into the feedlot uh, rather than through other, other channels. And that, that's also part of what's going on here. The, the feedlots did remain full for four years, but uh, at the beginning of 2024, they were up 2%. That's because they were going straight to the feedlot, not because there were more calves available. And so as a result, we were seeing some increased marketings and it kind of started to correct itself there in February just because of when those cattle were placed. So here's what's expected for beef production for 2024, the brown bars on the right side. And as you can see, it's gonna be down all four quarters. This shouldn't surprise anybody um, based on what we know is happening with with cattle numbers out there. Uh, let's just talk about trends in Wisconsin here. So in, uh, on the left chart is change in cattle on feed. And these charts actually, would, they look the, the exact same almost for uh, 2014 to 2023, uh, where we do see um, over, over time they're, they're low. But part of that low, again, as I described earlier, is because a lot of our feeders feeding their own corn, and they're not necessarily feeding a lot of cattle at one time, but a lot of smaller feeders added up, can add up to some bigger numbers, and they'll just kind of look at it in the fall and say, am I gonna fill a lot or not? And if, the, if they can sell the corn for a pretty good price and cattle prices are high, they'll say somebody else can take the risk, somebody else can have them. Um, if we look at a 10-year change in cow numbers, we said that cow numbers were down in Wisconsin, but our long-term, we're actually seeing increases in cow-calf uh, mama cows in Wisconsin over the long haul, even though right now from last year to this year, it's down. Our long-term trend has been a continued growth in that area. We got folks, you know, uh, transitioning out of dairy and getting into cow-calf or, or new landowners and things like that. And that's been a long, a long time trend in, in Wisconsin. So where will prices and output go? As you can see, um, for most of these, domestic consumption at the bottom, you can't see it, the beef is actually gonna be down some. Uh, price is probably gonna go up some for beef and uh, exports will be down for beef. Farm production will be down just because the numbers aren't there. 
The price on uh, farm price for uh, beef cattle is going to be somewhat variable, but in general trend up. Uh, we'll show you kind of what they expect it to do. So if we look at this chart on uh, the right hand side, or left hand side, excuse me, that's medium and large feeder, feeder steer prices. And uh, you can see the price on that four year average in the red line across the bottom through 2022. The dotted line is what happened in 2023 with feeder prices, and you guys are all aware they've, they've steadily climbed. Um, and as you can see, in the beginning of 2024, they have continued to steadily climb. And uh, what they're expecting is, um, for the first quarter, this would be year over year price increases. So they expect feeder calf prices to be 33% higher the first quarter of this year than they were last year. The second quarter, about 20% higher than a year ago. The third quarter, 11% higher. And then the fourth quarter, 21% higher. And then um, if we want to go over to um, live steers or fed cattle, you can see what they expect those prices to do. And, and you can see last year already, even prices jumped quite a bit from that uh, previous four-year average. So we expect prices to stay strong for cattle in 20. 24. Some of the things we have to keep an eye on that could influence things um, is the recession and the value of the dollar will have an influence on exports, and exports do have an influence on, on prices that are paid for cattle. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Proposition 12 could have some influence on pork production primarily, which if pork production is significantly impacted, there could be some benefits for the other, other meats. Um, that again, the high, high um, the avian influenza, the highly contagious one, if it affects the poultry markets, you know those prices are going to go up a lot, and then that would shift potential demand to the uh, other meats. Uh, African swine fever or PERS or some of the other diseases, if we have big outbreaks of those, they would inter um, have influence on, on their projections uh, as far as what we think is going to happen. And of course, there's other outstanding who knows what happens, factors that can come into play that something could happen tomorrow or Monday and everything I just shared with you, throw it out the window. I mean, we know that's reality. So, um, so now we'll talk about retaining heifers for expansion and what's going on and why do we see them going down even though prices have been pretty good for a while. Well, one of the big things is opportunity cost. You can sell those heifers for twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars as feeder calves. A lot of folks will say, maybe I don't need to expand yet. Maybe I'll stay the size I am and let let them go, right? Which makes sense. Um, I don't blame anybody for doing that. They'll probably hang on to enough that if they know probably five old cows need to go down the road, I'll keep six back so I have to maintain my size. But in our case, we also had drought. And if and hay supplies are down and pasture was short, and that means we're probably going to have to contract our herd a little bit to manage through what we've got, or we've got to buy expensive feed. So that's another factor coming into play. So feeder calves are really high. If we wanted to buy feed to feed them, that's going to be expensive now. That might be a pretty expensive heifer when she calves the first time. Uh, you know, you guys all know what I'm talking. I'm, I'm sure any, nothing here that is going to surprise you what I share with you. So then we get into that cost to raise them and calve them. Do we have labor and time? Uh, if we're going to add extra ones, all those things come into play. Um, you know, if we think about that, kind of a rule of thumb, and there's different ways you can calculate that, but one of the more common ones is they look at, so we raise this uh, heifer up, or we buy a springing heifer for X amount of dollars it costs you to raise or a buyer. How many calves does she have to have break even for the cost we got in here before we're starting to see money. No rule of thumb, and everybody's different. And somewhere around six calves before we start to see they've got their debt paid off and now it's, it's profitable. Because we look at you know the initial cost, the annual cost to, to keep her, and all those things um, to, to look at that. Some of the work I saw recently, they were kind of suggesting at some of these higher prices, it may take a few more calves than six to do that, okay? So something to keep in mind. Um, this is pulled out of the Center for Farm Financial Management, FinBIM, uh, over at, at uh, Minnesota. 
And what I did was uh, look around in there at the cow-calf operations and the best data pool, I think, that represents western Wisconsin because these data is hard to find, is eastern Minnesota. So this is basically the east, uh, east half of Minnesota, similar enough climate to us. And so the blue bar on that is the total annual cost for a cow-calf or a mama cow uh, to have her around. And then the orange bar is the feed alone. No, no surprise there, feed's roughly half. But the average herd size in this was probably somewhere around 40 cows, and there's about 32 um, farms in this. So it's not a big data pool, but this is about the only source of information we have. And this is average. And you can go in there and you can look at the range and it's a huge spread. So I guess part of my message is, as you can see, those costs have been creeping up. But there's a wide range and the most important thing for you to do is know your own if you don't already work that out. And so we know, yeah, it's $1,200 to have that cow and it's a good thing that those calves are selling for close to $3 a pound to help cover that cost. And so, you know, it's not just feed that's getting more expensive. You guys all know pickup trucks and repair bills for parts from the, from the store and, and several of those other things have, be, have, have steadily increased and so we know that cost of production is going up, okay? But again, this is average and that's not telling the truth about anybody because some of you guys are better than average and some may be not better than average. So um, if, you, if you already have a tools to help you look at your cost of production, that's great. If you're maybe looking for some spreadsheet tools to help figure out your own cost of production, uh, if you go to our UW Extension Livestock webpage, there is a decision tools and software uh, link there in the box on the left hand side. We do have a cow-calf budget. We also have a replacement heifer budget tool. If you're kind of thinking about keeping some back, you can plug some numbers in there to figure out how much it's going to cost, help you make an informed decision on what's going to be best for you. We do have stocker budgets and a stocker closeout spreadsheet tool for if you want to have grass cattle. And the, the stocker, uh, those would actually even work if you're taking feeder calves and plug the numbers in all the way to when you sell them as, as grass-fed beef, they would work for that too. Um, so if you're looking for some tools to help with that, um, they are there available for you to use, okay? Because um, you can make better decisions when you know what your cost of production are. I'm sure some of you already know what yours are, um, but if you're not sure, those are some tools that can help you with that. So I do want to spend the last little bit of time talking about livestock risk uh, protection, LRP insurance. Anybody here use it at all? Nobody? And I'm not telling you you got to go use it. I just want you to know what it is so you can decide or look into it further uh, if you want to use it or not, okay? So what it does, it's not, it's not intended to help you make money. What it is is to help protect the value that you have there, the potential value that you have there from unforeseen price drops, okay? So right now, futures markets all say prices are going to stay strong throughout the year, we saw what their projections are. And that's good and we hope they do, but sometimes bad things happen and, and they crash. Um, so it's based on you get to select the coverage price. And those are produced daily. Um, and then basically you would get paid if the actual ending value of cattle is below the coverage level that you purchased. Okay, and you can, the coverage levels, you can range from 70 to 100% of the expected end value. So how, how are the coverage values determined? And they're, they're determined daily, every day, the, the, the CME uh, trades. And the coverage level is based off of uh, futures prices and the options prices are what the premium is based off of. Now they've made some changes to this. It came out, oh, probably 18, 19 years ago, and it was not very farmer friendly. But a couple of years ago, they implemented changes. Those have been put into place now. And it 
initially you actually had to pay the premium up front. So think of this sort of like crop insurance for your, for your cattle. Now the premium is actually due at the end of the endorsement period. So roughly, as I show you how this works a little more, roughly about the time you sell the cattle, it's due. So it fits better with cash flow. It's subsidized better than it used to be. Initially, uh, the premium was subsidized at 13%. Now it's anywhere from 33 to 55%. Basically, if you select the 70% coverage, it's going to be at the 55%, and then it gradually declines. And if you select the 98% or 99.8% coverage level, then it's a 35% subsidy. Okay. So, um, and you look at it, when you look at the sheets, it's going to show you what those coverage levels are that you could purchase at the different percentage of coverage levels in those that many different weeks out. So, for instance, if we're calving soon, got calves on the ground, and we know we normally sell our calves feeder calves at the end of October or early November, we would find a date close to that and, and look at those prices to have that price protection in place at around the time of sale. Um, that's what you want to do. And then you use your expected sale weight to set up what hundred weights of calf you want to insure. Um, one of the caveats is and this is actually better than it used to be. So you don't have to sell them at the end. If you choose to own them longer, that's fine. But your coverage would settle up. Either you own the premium or you get an indemnity, depending on the ending value, on the day that it ends. Um, but you aren't allowed to sell them up to 60 days prior to the ending of, the, of your coverage agreement. Uh, with the insurance company without a penalty. And so, and it's uh, the other thing that is uh, sometimes difficult for folks to wrap their mind around is the, the value, the ending value is based on the feeder calf index, which is prices from several feeder calf sales, not in Wisconsin, but Iowa and several other states with large feeder calf volume uh, for feeder calves. They'll collect all those prices and come up with that index value and use that as your final price. Normally when feeder calf prices go down in the United States, they generally go down everywhere in the United States. If they go up, they generally go up everywhere. So even though Wisconsin's not represented, when they go down in those uh, index places, they're going to go down here because folks can either go there and buy them or come here and buy them and the pressure, sale pressure will be the same. If you buy it for fed cattle that's based off the five area weekly weighted average and again when the prices go up there they go generally go up everywhere and they go down there they generally go down everywhere. That way it's actually less paperwork for you. You don't have to keep a record of everything they got sold and go in there and show that to your insurance agent what you sold them for to settle up. Okay. Uh, for feed or cattle there's Two weight ranges are either 100 to 600 or 599 pounds or 600 up to 1,000 pounds. What else is new? You can actually uh, insure your unborn calf crop if you want to insure it early enough, looking out when you normally would sell it. So in January, and you don't, you know, or now, if you don't calve till April or May, and you see a really nice price out there when you normally sell it, hey, I would like that to be my floor. You could buy it. They assume with an unborn calf crop, half bulls, half heifers. And uh, when you sign up for these, you agree with your, uh, with the contract to allow for your insurance agent to inspect, come look at at any point in time, uh, and you have to produce evidence. So you might want to have how many cows you got and what the preg check report from the vet said you got this many pregnant if they were to ask to verify that prior to the calves being born. Okay. Um, they expanded the limits. I don't, anybody in here may have 
12,000 head at a time, maybe, maybe not. Most probably won't. But the nice part is, the, you know, if you wanted to buy puts and calls or futures contracts, you got to do it on semi-load sizes of cattle, that many pounds. But this, you can do one head if you want, or smaller herds, 10 head or 15 or 30 or whatever it is, and so you don't have that much money sitting out there uh, for risk management. And, and there is some price adjustment factors. Um, you can do, you know, we can injure Holstein steer calves uh, and, uh, or Brahmas. You're probably not going to see those around here. But uh, there is a little bit of, of adjustment to those ending values. So, for instance, I pulled up and looked at what was the offer uh, coverage level for the end of October, early November time frame that you could put a floor in place yesterday evening. And the futures market, their coverage level said for those lighter weight calves, 294 a pound. Okay? That looks pretty good to me. I don't know about you. And it said that what the cost was, the sub, so the subsidized cost, so the actual full cost was $15. At the subsidy level, at the 99% coverage level, was 10 bucks. So you had $10 a hundred weight to pay to have that 294 floor in at the end, based off of those indexes. Um, if the price goes up, beautiful. If the price goes down, that would be in place to help protect you. Okay, those change every day. So um, it may be, it will probably be somewhat different Monday. Um, so how it works is you actually get yourself an insurance agent that handles it and you fill out an application with them ahead of time because there's a very narrow window every day for purchasing a coverage endorsement. So your application means you're effectively approved to, to get an endorsement on a number of head of cattle at a certain rate at whatever price you choose. They start at 3.30 p.m. They post the options that you can buy for all the different weeks and the different coverages available. And you can buy that from 3.30 through 8.25 the next morning. They do that because that's not when the futures market's doing its thing. So they have a kind of a constant baseline there. This is what the future says at that point in time. All right. Um, it does not cover death loss. It does not cover, well, my cattle didn't grow as well this year. Um, so if any animals die that you have coverage on, you have co call your insurance agent within 72 hours and let them know. And what they'll do is, according to the rules, They'll leave that animal on there, and so you, even you, you would get the, you would still have to pay the premium, but you would also, if it, you would get an indemnity for that injured animal. The way the rules say, if you don't report it, then you're in breach of contract, and you get to pay the premium, but you would not get any indemnity. And I don't work for the government, and I don't make a nickel off this. I'm just sharing with you what the rules are. Okay. Um, so if you're interested, I would, I would encourage you to find uh, an insurance agent that handles this, and I'll show you where you can find that and, and talk more about them with it to learn more details. But, so your specific endorsement would be, I see that price, like what I shared earlier, I want to cover my feeder calves for that. Um, that was steer calves, and, and I've got my steer calves here, 20 of them, 25. Maybe I insure all of them, maybe I insure all but a couple of them because once in a while one dies. You can work that out with the insurance agent how they would like that handled. But you're going to need the number of animals, uh, what type they are by definition that they have for feeder calves, steers or heifers, uh, or unborn. And you're going to need your target cell weight. And you're going to need at what date are you looking to do that, and that should be based on roughly when you sell them and your coverage price. And if you're a partial owner in a group of calves and you want to cover your portion but your partner doesn't, 
you can cover your ownership share. And they can not if they don't want to, okay? Um, this is what the reports look like, and that's where you can find them. Um, so in order to find an agent, if you go to the, the rmausda.gov website, um, up in the tools section, you can do agent locator, and it'll bring up all the folks that have it. If you have crop insurance on your other acres, you can ask your crop insurance agent if they handle it, because it's all through the same RMA, um, to look more into it. All right, that was it, and I would be happy to answer questions if you have. I hope I'm keeping it.